So, we are about to embark on a discussion of the kingdom fungi. But before we do, I want to tell you another story of the history of science and why we need to talk about things like homoplasy, conversion evolution, and why systematics and biodiversity might be important to you. Before we launch into the kingdom fungi, let's think back to our discussion of the Oomycota. Uh, Oomycetes are in the stramenopila of the SAR clade, but it was not always so. When I introduced the Oomycetes, one reason I said they were important enough to mention is their homoplasy with the kingdom of fungi, and another is their huge impact on human history, mainly by destroying our food crops and affecting plant communities as disease agents. I also showed you this phylogram, demonstrating how distantly related oomycetes are to the true fungi. This phylogram makes it look like it's an easy distinction, but this tree represents an enormous amount of effort by evolutionary biologists and systematists. This nice clean tree is a distillation, a cleaner version of this tree, and this tree was a great leap forward in terms of comparing lots of microscopic monsters from the base of the eukaryotic tree. Nowadays, we recognize the clades of all those organisms we call protists, but from the dawn of microscopy until the late 20th century, our understanding of the evolution of these groups was based primarily on morphology, or how they looked. And comparing the morphology of these wee beasties is difficult. For simplicity's sake, instead of looking at the millions of described protists, let's just say there are four. We want to infer the evolutionary history of these things based on their appearance, but they are so different from each other, there are good reasons to say they diverged like this, but we could also argue that they diverged like this, or like this, or maybe even like this. The problem is that many eukaryotic lineages have odd apomorphies that don't lend themselves to grouping with other eukaryotes. But a widely agreed upon tree topology was that oomycetes were closely related to fungi based on morphology. After all, they share a number of characteristics. In fact, there was a really well-crafted story of the evolutionary history of fungi which had oomycetes as a basal lineage and characteristics evolving along to the way. It was a great story. However, some folks, namely Ava Sansome and Clive Brazier, had produced some data that challenged this story. Fungi, it was widely known, exhibit zygotic meiosis. In other words, haploid dominant. Brazier and Sansome showed that oomycetes in the genus Phytophthora were diploid dominant with gametic meiosis. Scientists in the 1970s were very doubtful. Switching from haploid dominant to diploid dominant or vice versa was a very uncommon occurrence, something that would define an entire biological kingdom. These data, if accepted, shook the foundation of the story of the evolutionary history of fungi, so the easy thing for scientists to do was to disregard the data. So. How did scientists come to accept that oomycetes were not really fungi? Fast forward to the 1990s and a new technology called the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. This technology made working with DNA much, much easier. And a nice thing about DNA is that it is one of the ultimate symplesiomorphies. In other words, all life has it and in abundance. Another one of those ultimate symplesiomorphies is the presence of ribosomes, which turn mRNA into proteins. Ribosomes are made up of RNA and protein, and the instructions for those molecules are encoded in the DNA. Since all organisms have ribosomes, and all ribosomes are encoded in DNA, we could compare all of the weird-looking eukaryotes that didn't have much else in common morphologically and come up with a well-supported tree topology that scientists could agree upon. 
DNA supported much of the morphological data about the eukaryote tree, but the DNA also challenged some of the assumptions, including the position of the oomycota relative to the fungi. Instead of a very close relationship, the tree looked more like this, or in more simplified terms, like this, and thus a breakup of the oomycetes and the true fungi one that Brazier and Sansome had suggested was coming, was nigh. Rather, it had always been that way, we just didn't have enough of the data for us to understand. Because this is a practical world, you may be asking these questions. This brings me back to the third point from my earlier talk about oomycetes, the fact that we like to eat things that fungi and oomycetes also like to eat, like potatoes, for example. The science of plant pathology, or treating plant sickness, really got started in the 19th century with events such as the Irish potato famine. In that tragedy, the Oomycetes won the battle for the potatoes of Ireland, leading to humans starving and fleeing in droves. But now with science, it was becoming clear that plant diseases were very often caused by fungi and fungus-like organisms. This led to the very first fungicides or chemical agents to kill fungi. These chemicals could be very broad range agents or more specific. For companies that research and develop fungicides, broad range fungicides are appealing because it's more lucrative. However, developing a fungicide that is toxic to oomycetes and true fungi means some other organisms might be caught in the crossfire. In other words, if a substance is toxic to both oomycetes and true fungi, is it likely to harm animals also? The answer is probably yes. So why am I telling you this story of science? Because again, you might be feeling like this course doesn't have much to do with your professional aspirations or your role as a citizen in the world. However, a couple of points that I hope you will take away. First of all, this is me, Dr. Zanzo, a human and a scientist, taking you on a deep dive into a subject that I have expertise in. I train as a plant pathologist and I've worked with both oomycetes and true fungi. So this is me showing off a bit, but it's not just about that. Understanding biodiversity is important not just to sate human curiosity about the world we live in, but also for practical reasons. We've seen it before, we see it here again, and we'll see it as we continue to discuss organismal biology. Thirdly, but certainly not finally, science is not static. It's not stationary. It's dynamic. Our understanding of the natural world and the observable universe is always moving, and most of that time that motion is forward. But good scientists don't deal in absolutes. We allow for our understanding to grow and change, not just personally, but institutionally. <laughs>